kick this off? Um, yeah. So kind of where we're going, just a little bit about me. Uh, then we'll talk about CNC, where that got started. And we'll talk about the beginning of printers, printer infrastructure, and then we'll talk about Jubilee at the very end. Uh, so just kind of a mild roadmap. Um, OK, so about me, um, I'm a general engineer. I'm from Pasadena, California. I went to college at Harvey Mudd, which is this tiny little school in Southern California. It's a good community of people who really like math, science, and engineering. I do miss them there. I have good dear friends who are now spread, ar spread around, around the continent, and actually, well, around the world, actually. Um, but yeah, uh, I got a degree in general engineering, which I like to say means bad at everything. Um, but what that actually really did for me was it really whetted my appetite. So I became this project enthusiast from all things, I would say, bits to like bolts. Uh, so this project over here, this is a couple years ago. Um, I got really into MEM sensors. These are these little chips that you can, they're traditionally, they're mass produced for your cell phone. So you can um, do things like understand your orientation in space and decide whether or not your phone is, should be right side up or horizontal. Um, so what I ended up doing is I put a bunch of those on a breadboard, strung them together along this pool noodle, and then wrote a little bit of code to string together a representation of what the noodle would look like on the computer based on how you were bending it. Uh, so I called it the IMU noodle, because it's just a bunch of inertial measurement units on a pool noodle. Um, but yeah, so I deeply, I deeply love electronics projects, but also like mechatronics projects. Um, this is something I did a long time ago. Um, this is a old uh, Nintendo video game console called a Nintendo GameCube, which was around from, let's say, like 2001 to about 2008 was the, the heyday of the Nintendo GameCube. And I thought, well, it was such a fun little console, but it was kind of a joke. Well, why, no, why don't we just play the console instead of playing the video games on the console? So I made this little remote control chassis that I could stick inside of the GameCube and drive that around instead. But yeah, um, at some point, I got really interested in machine design. I wanted to do cosplay, and I thought, well, cosplay is super cool. People are taking 3D models, and they're cutting them by hand out of paper, and then they're folding them back up into this 3D model, and they're painting them and finishing them. And then they're going to, they're going to like, make her fair looking like Boba Fett. So I thought that was the coolest thing ever, and I wanted to take part in that. So at some point, I, I printed my first model. This was like an Iron Man hand. And I realized that the part that was really, really painful was the actual physically cutting out the, the paper model by hand from a printer. And so I figured, well, what if I had a, a machine to do that? So I went to, the school, went to the, um, the school machine shop and used their laser cutter. And what took me about four hours took me about five minutes on the machine. So I thought, OK, I, I need a laser cutter that can cut paper. So that was kind of how I started into machine design, was that I really wanted a machine that cuts paper. So the first thing I did was build a frame. Um, and I did a couple versions of that. At the time, uh, this thing called CoreXY came out, which was, it was basically a website with a belt pattern on it. So I copied that. Um, it didn't have a, a laser on it. So that was the next step. Was Again, rebuild it and then put a laser head on it. Um, but unfortunately, the, the laser wasn't powerful enough, so it would only cut black paper, not white paper, because black absorbs a little bit more energy. Um, and I, I couldn't buy black paper because that was more expensive. So I figured I needed to just go a little bit bigger. So I made a 60 watt one, and that one has been working actually really well. Um, so uh, that one was back a couple years later. Um, so again, the goal started off as cosplay. And I actually kind of forgot about that along the way. At some point, I had this nice tool, and I thought, well, wh what can I do with it? And what ended up happening is that I realized I could do animatronics with it. Um, so this, it was this mixing and matching of laser cut parts, which are kind of in the upper corners, we're cutting out these little segments, and then stock parts, which are things you can buy. So like wheel hubs, um, cables, springs, and then kind of your conventional fasteners. And if you combine all those together, you're able to do things like these tentacle mechanisms. Um, so I thought these were really cool, and I wanted to share them with people. So at some point, I started showing people how to build these. Um, I went to Hackaday Supercon a couple years, and I, I kind of kitized about 15 of them in both, both events, and then made some assembly instructions for them, and then showed people how to work with this like, vocabulary of parts, which is this mixing and matching of fasteners and laser cut components. Um, so these days, um, a professor actually found me at one of those events and said, hey, like, um, that she was starting a lab. And I said, wow, you're starting a lab in, in, with people working with machines. Like, can you sign me up? Uh, so I, now at UW, I'm working at her lab. Our lab is machine agency. And kind of the general goal is to figure out how to enable people with better machine infrastructure. 
And so I'm the person in the middle, and then Jasper is on the left, and Hannah is on the right. So that's our lab. And then Prof Nadia is not in this picture, but she is um, the, the lab PI. Uh, and so we're all working on separate projects, but um, I would say Jasper is working on more the idea of being able to produce a machine design driven by high-level software. And Hannah is looking at work work workflows in machine design where um, you might start with a model, and actually you might have to take several steps from model to actual physical parts, having that part in your hand. So Hannah's trying to look at these different workflow steps and see if you can squish and consolidate them and make them easier. Um, yeah, and then I'm working on mainly looking at the machines themselves and then figuring out how to kind of spread good design patterns and um, enable people with machines that have capabilities that they might not have for a lower cost point. So that's a little bit about us. Um, so I figured um, it doesn't make sense to really dive into uh, this too deeply before actually talking about where we came from. I think that's always something that's really helpful for me to kind of like reset in my brain, like how did all of this happen and why, is this, why, why does this exist in the first place? And it turns out there were a lot of people who, who came before, before today in 2020. So I figured I'd talk a little bit about the history of CNC. So first off, what is CNC? I'm pretty sure most people already know about this already. Um, it's computer numerical control, so it's a machine that is driven programmatically um, to move around by a computer. Um, a lot of these are in the manufacturing industry. They are making parts for people, um, and they're slowly becoming more familiar to people as 3D printers and laser cutters are things that now uh, consumers can buy, and that's, those are all CNC machines. So uh, another question is why? Why is, why is CNC? Um, or why, why did we need this? Why did it happen to, why did it come to be? Um, and a lot of that was because of mass production. People wanted more parts, and this kind of, this creation of the middle class ended up having, um, w was this space where you could actually have people go to work for a factory and then buy things um, as a result. Um, and that was the new infrastructure. Um, and at the same time, there were other motivations. There's actually a really good book about it called Forces of Production. Um, it turns out that war is actually a really good motivation to get people to build things that are more and more precise for cheaper and cheaper. Um, so going back to 1913, this is kind of the beginning of the moving assembly line. Um, this was uh, Henry Ford. Uh, the, idea, the idea was that you have a bunch of skilled laborers. What if you kind of reduced the amount of skill that they needed by putting them into specific spots along an assembly line that was moving? And the result was that people were able to produce things a lot more quickly. You had cars that were taking 12 minutes, went down to 90 minutes. And I think, you're, I think nowadays people can do like 12 cars a minute, which is kind of ridiculous. Um, but that was kind of this idea of mass production um, by means of a moving assembly line. Um, so uh, we kind of move forward into history, and we meet this person, John Parsons. John Parsons was uh, kind of uh, born around the time, uh, uh, and grew up in around the time of World War II. And so around age 17 and the 40s was when this point where he started playing around in the factory of his father. Um, the factory was Parsons Corporation, and they made helicopter blades. Um, so at some point, I think the story of John Parsons is that he was allowed to get away with things that you probably wouldn't get away with if you were just an employee. So he, because he was the son of the person who owned the factory, he would play around with the, with the machines. And as a result, he ended up learning a lot from doing that. Um, so at some point uh, in 1947, the US Air Force asked Parsons Corporation to deliver a series of airfoil templates. So an airfoil looks like this. This is from a wind turbine, but in this case, it was in their case, it was for a helicopter. Um, what's tricky about this is that this is before the era of computers. Um, so what you had to do is you would essentially make this booklet. And the booklet looked was a series of templates, which is what these cross sections would end up being comprised of, or which comprised of these cross sections. And so what the US Air Force wanted was this, essentially this booklet of all these cross-sectional templates so that they could then use that as a reference to make their helicopter blades. So um, the problem with this is that like, you need to, to fly, you need a very, to fly well, you need a very specific shape of an airfoil, and that's mathematically driven. And so what they were doing is that in the world where people were doing this manually, you drive it from a template. And so you still had to produce the template, though. And so people would end up doing, would draft these out by hand. So, whoops, going forward, Parsons said, okay, wait a minute. What if we, everyone's doing this all by hand, 
what if we actually uh, pre-drill a bunch of holes to save some time, and then we could, we could file the holes down to be smooth? So what that looked like is, what if we just took the drill press and went droop, 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 and just drilled out approximately the right shape? And then we have all these little like, bits that are burrs, and we just take a file and you just file that down. And that would actually save us a lot of time than having to do everything from scratch. And so um, it turns out that uh, there's still, like that was a good idea, except there's still a lot of calculations of where do you put the holes. Um, so this, this is the area, the, uh, like the dawn of com computing, where it became something that you could start to buy. So he said, wait a minute, I can get an IBM 602 from IBM, I can get a loader machine, and we can calculate all the holes from them. And so uh, he went to IBM and said, hey, I, I have this problem, which is I need to cut a bunch of holes in a bunch of specific XY coordinates. Um, can you help us? And can we buy a machine from you? And they said, well, that's weird. Normally our machines are for like secretarial work, but absolutely you can buy a machine from us. And it turns out that actually worked. Um, yeah, it worked really, really well. So what happened is that they um, were able to now pre-drill a bunch of holes, and the templates, were, you could make them a little more accurately um, with less skill. And so Parsons comes up with this next version of his idea called the cardomatic mill, which is doing the same thing, but in 3D, where you would drill down to a specific depth. And at some point, someone said, hey, there's another lab at MIT that's doing something similar. You should go talk to them. So he does, and they strike a partnership. And that ends up being this lab. This is, the 19, this is 1952, the MIT Servo Mechanism Lab. Um, so they start a, part, uh, a partnership, and they're able to now tap into this wealth of, of money from the United States Air Force to start investigating CNC. So around this time period, 1952, they take uh, the hand cranks of a milling machine, and they replace it with uh, servo motors, and they direct the motion with a computer. And this is really like the beginnings of, of CNC that we know today. Um, so the sad story, uh, the sad part about this story is that Parsons actually gets pushed out of the contracts through some clever negotiating at, um, well, some nefarious negotiating of the people who were running the lab at MIT. And eventually, MIT is able to exclusively bring in future contracts and kind of, and push out Parsons completely, which is very sad for Parsons, but um, kind of that is how the story goes. Um, so yeah, so that uh, is kind of the end of the history. And now, as we know today, um, these machines are very, very capable, they're fast, they're also expensive, um, but they're also highly automatable. So they have a lot of capabilities, but they're expensive. Um, they're also capable of cutting uh, very dense materials. So just a quick example, this is an automatic tool changer on, I believe, a Haas machine, um, which is a machining center. Um, but now let's go forward in time to 2008, or 2004, 2008, this area. And around this time, this is when the first 3D printers start coming out. Um, so the one on the left is 2006, that's the Fab at Home. And then the one on the right is 2000, that's the, like the 2011 version, I think, that's the RepRap. So this is, a, this is at a point in history when patents on existing 3D printers expire, and we can now actually start exploring this as on, on like a hobbyist level. Um, the project on the left is, these two more or less actually happened at the same time, but I think a lot more people are actually familiar with the one on the right, which is the RepRap, and the one on the left was, um, we actually don't hear about it very often, but they did happen at the same time. So, um, just a, qu a question to ask, just to take a step back from where we've been, is what is the 3D printer? And I think most people already know this already, but it's a CNC machine. But what's different about it is that it's cheap, and it's for consumers and it's much easier to use than an industrial CNC machine. So, um, so going through the history of printers, uh, there, there's Adrian Boyer, so he was the person responsible for the project on the right. He creates this uh, narrative of self-replication. He says, ah, the RepRap is, is going to be this machine that can reproduce itself, but it needs help from a human to actually hit the go button and create the spare parts and then have the human assemble the, the second, the second uh, RepRap. So he created this narrative, which you can actually read about in the dissertation of one of his students, which he talks about this idea of self-replication and this, and where the printer is like a, almost like a living organism that wants to be, wants to be reproduced, and it's going to have this symbiotic relationship with the human, and together they're going to kind of, they're going to reproduce each other, and there will be evolution where people tinker and change things a little bit. But the idea is that the RepRap was this project that wanted to, it, it was a species that wanted to evolve and grow in different ways and humans were in this symbiotic relationship with it. It's quite, 
strange and abstract, but a lot of interesting things, a lot of uh, like actionable things distilled out of it. So a good example is that um, the idea of being like a rep wrap like machine is something that has mostly 3D printed parts. Um, and then everything else that's not a 3D printed part is something that he called a vitamin. And we kind of actually still use some of this language today. If you're talking, if you're in the 3D printer community pretty deeply, people will call like the nuts and bolts the mechanical vitamins. So a lot of that still bleeds into today. Um, but yeah, so it was this idea of you have a self-replicating replicator and you, this creature like wanted to grow exponentially and it was going to evolve by people changing it and you wanted to rely, we wanted to, you wanted to maximize kind of reliance on a single person and minimize reliance on like industrial practices. Um, so yeah, it's a self-replicating printer. Uh, so now around 2008, this is the first duplicate that was made. There's the parent on the left and the child on the right. And they are in fact, prov they are able to make themselves, which is pretty awesome. Um, the community that formed around it, he started a forum and a wiki, just kind of explaining the rep-rap theory and how it works. And then people started building their own rep-rap machines and posting questions and asking about it on this forum. Um, so uh, since the original rep-rap, lots of people have played around and done different, and made different versions of this. And it's kind of spawned all sorts of reimaginings over the years. Um, and as a result, we've got a lot of improvements in hardware, but also software. So if you look on the left, this is a kind of the state of the art back in like 2000, maybe 12. And the one on the right is 2000. It was something that you could do now in like 2017, where the, the what's different with the one on the right is it has sharper corners, versus the one on the left has these very oozy corners. And the reason that they were able to do that is somebody wrote uh, a piece of software called the pressure advance algorithm, which kind of slows down the, the pushing force of the extruder as you go around a sharp corner. And when you tune that a little bit, you're able to get very clean results. So people have been working on doing all sorts of community improvements in hardware, but also in software over the years. And then finally, uh, so uh, here's an example of uh, improvements in hardware. Somebody, so Elon Moyer in 2012 came up with this core XY belt pattern, which is the thing on the left. He uh, public posted it on a website and said, hey, here's the core XY belt pattern. It's awesome because the motors stay in the bottom of the machine, so you don't have to have any of your XY motors uh, on any moving parts. They're stationary. And as a result, your moving carriage can be made much lighter, and so you can go faster. And people thought this was a good idea, so they started copying it. So there's a couple examples here. There's the rail core in the middle, and then this other printer called the Son of Mega Max on the upper right. But lots of people are, are using this core XY belt pattern because it's light and fast. Yeah, and then finally, people started meeting each other. There were community events. Uh, I think in 2013, somebody in the middle of Indiana said, hey, I think 3D printing is cool, and I'm gonna, have, I'm gonna bring a bunch of my friends over, and I'll invite people over to my garage, and we'll bring our 3D printers. So I think he expected 10 people, and he got 40 people. Um, and that was the birth of the, mid the Midwest uh, Rep Rap Festival. And so ever since then, it's grown ever since, um, I think last year, there were like several thousand people who went, who were like in and out on that weekend. And it's just, uh, it's, it goes to show how much people n now in, in like the, the world really know a lot more about, about 3D printing uh, than they did in the, in the past. This is a particularly fun festival because you ha it's this community of people who are all, um, they have all brought their printer, they brought their own machine, it's very personal for them. Uh, and so you can go and talk to anyone at any booth and they will gladly talk to you for uh, an hour about all the little design choices that they've made and what they really like about their machine. So printers today are, are cheap. They're ubiquitous and lots of people in the consumer world know about them and that's thanks to CNC and, and RepRap and then um, good marketing and, and costs that go down over time. So what else is happening in the 3D printer world though that's maybe not necessarily related to the 3D printing? Um, and that's, that's actually people using printers for not printing um, or not necessarily, or not printing uh, parts maybe. So I would kind of describe this as uh, a, the machine is now a piece of infrastructure. It's, it's, a, it's something that people are, are, they're using it for not printing, but they're, they're taking the, the head off and they're putting something else on and their, their G code is telling it to do something different instead of just extrude. So on the left, people are doing electro spinning where they have a high voltage on the plate and they're able to deposit this like fuzzy felting. They're, they're essentially able to felt in place um, using a high voltage uh, differential between the nozzle and the plate, so they're able to create these felts on, on demand. In the middle, people are doing it for science. They are drawing with a, I guess, with iron on a gel. 
Um, this is a little bit beyond me, but um, they're but they're they've essentially repurposed their printer to do not printing and actually to do uh, gel depositions. And then finally, on the right, people are are taking all the infrastructure from 3D printing and they're using like the the controller boards. They're using the cheap linear rails that you can buy, and they're making something different. So this is a pancake bot, which came out a couple years ago, which kind of takes advantage of all that infrastructure, all those cheap parts, all that easy to write software. Um, is now you're able to make other stuff. Um, so I think this, this was like the, this is the reason why I'm in grad school, which was I was asking this question of like, or, or this is how I'm able to stay in grad school, which is ask research questions, um, which is what do low cost 3D printers offer besides the printing? And I think the answer is this like lightweight automation that's becoming more more easy for people to work with. Um, it's yes, yeah, so this programmable motion. And so this next question was like, is there a way we could just give away the motion capabilities of 3D printing without packaging up it up as a printer and, and necessitating that people unscrew the printer head in order to put something different on it. And I think the answer is yes. Uh, we can build a machine that is meant to be extended, a machine that isn't meant necessarily for 3D printing, but can be meant for other things as well, where extending it is a first class feature. And that's Jubilee. That is, so this has been about a year's worth of work, uh, like a year and a half of trying to figure out how do we build a machine that is meant to be extended by other people such that you could bolt on different things without needing to be a necessarily a machine designer to do something that involves mo programmable motion. Programmable motion. Um, so V1 came out on September 9. I think that's where the project really um, picked up a little bit of traction. I posted the files on GitHub. V2, um, you can already see what's on V2 if you click on the drop-down menu in GitHub. But it'll be officially released on January 15. I'm just uh, making it a little bit cheaper. Um, yeah, so that's kind of that is uh, the story of how this got situated. So what actually goes into Jubilee? So I kind of took this this general idea of what did I actually want and distilled it down into a bunch of like design objectives. So I wanted a machine that that did a bunch of stuff. I wanted people to be able to reproduce it by going online, looking at a, a bill of materials, and being able to just go buy those parts. And then in addition, looking at the remaining parts and being able to either print them or laser cut them. So you needed to be able to reproduce the machine wherever you were in the world without um, relying on specialty processes. So if you didn't have a CNC machine, if you didn't have a, a lathe, that, that, that should be OK. You should still be able to build one of these machines. Um, I wanted, uh, OK, so I wanted to present uh, all the information of any, any like upfront knowledge that you might need to know, all of that had to be presented upfront in the assembly instructions. So if something had to like twist together just right, I had to show people step by step how to do that because I can't assume that they know how to do that already. Um, I think one of the things about open source right now is that we kind of give away the code and expect that people know how to program already to be able to use it. Um, but the difference between this is that I can give away the CAD file but I also will give it away with instructions. That way people can actually follow the instructions step by step, not already knowing how to build the machine, such that by the end, they can still build the machine. So we looked at these ideas, and because we're in school, uh, we make up words for things. So we made up this word called fabricatable. Um, so this, it was this idea, it, was, it kind of collects these two ideas. I would kind of describe it as design for manufacturing. But fabricatable was this idea where you kind of pack all the knowledge of what's needed into the release of the thing. So it goes into the design. And then in addition, all the parts that you draw from are, fr are they use processes that are easy, readily available uh, to people, so that like 3D printing, and they don't require a lot of upfront knowledge, or they're something that is a, like a stock component, something you can, very, you can buy very easily. Uh, so this is kind of that distilled down in a nutshell. And then this is an example early part that was on Jubilee that got replaced later on. But it definitely still shows the ideas here of kind of this fabricatability where you have this precision component, which is actually a collection of multiple components. The big gray piece is printed. The piece in the middle is uh, a bushing that you can buy. And then the remaining pieces, or the, the six uh, screws are shoulder screws. And then there's like two laser cut pieces. And so. If you put all those together, yes, you have more parts, but now you have less specialty processes. Uh, and you have less um, specialty processes that require less upfront knowledge to put the thing together. 
so just kind of a couple of examples of, of what's, of why Jubilee is like fabricatable. Uh, just looking at some of the parts that are on Jubilee, it's this, mish, it's this, this uh, mishmash of, of parts that you can buy. So there are pins that get pressed in. Um, there are parts that are printed and then um, parts that are laser cut. So the white pieces up here, these are laser cut. These are printed. The spring you can buy, the cable you can buy, but there's no necessarily, uh, there's, there's not necessarily any specialty parts. There's one exception, which is the little twisty T thing in the middle, but I can talk about that at the very end. But yeah, so we have something that's fabricatable, we check. Uh, we want something that's extensible. So now uh, well the machine, we have to be able to build off of the machine um, because we want it to be more than just a printer. So how do, we, how do we make it extensible? Well, one easy way is to do removable parts. Um, so uh, what we want to do is we want somebody to be able to bolt something on and then take it off and then maybe bolt something on again and take it off again. And we want those, that, those two pieces to come together in the exact same spot every time. That way you don't have to play around with aligning things ever so slightly perfectly every time. Uh, so it, that, that, the term for that is it has to be repeatable. Um, and I took some inspiration, actually a lot from E3D. Back in 2018, I saw this uh, Twitter post from them and I thought, wow, that is the coolest thing ever. The coolest thing ever. Um, and I realized that um, what they were doing is they were relying on this thing called the method of exact constraint. So I went back to the books and I was trying to figure out what, what, what was so special about this coupling here. And it, tooks out, it turns out that they're using these principles called exact constraint design, which is a way for joining parts together in a way that they don't, in, they don't bind or wiggle if you follow this kind of recipe for design. Um, and if you do that, then you can get things that fit together only in one way. Um, and that's what this coupling is doing right here. Um, so thank you E3D for actually kind of presenting that to the world and presenting an example of how to use it and where it's useful. So uh, the, what they're doing is that's it's, what they have is a kinematic coupling. And what it's doing is joining two parts together using the minimum number of points of contact. And if you do that, it doesn't bind, it doesn't wiggle, and it only fits together in one way, which is really, really cool. Uh, so what they specifically used was called a Maxwell coupling, or a version of the Maxwell coupling. This has been known about for like, over 100 years, but I think we have kind of forgotten about it as we are be able, we are able to trade precision for, for money, and so we can use uh, we can buy a precision part instead of um, making a precision part. So this is, uh, but back in 100 years ago, they, they had to get their precision by what they made, and so they relied on things like exact constraint design to do that. Um, so the way this works is that you have uh, two, two planes, essentially, that you want to come together, and the way that they're going to touch each other is through um, three grooves and three balls. So what happens is that you have six points of contact, and if you have only those six points of contact, there's no other way for it to wiggle together. I actually brought one of these if you want to play with it um, because it's, it actually feels kind of magical. It only like slips in one way and there's no other way for it to come together and it doesn't wiggle. Um, so come by and I'll show you how that works or you'll get a feel for it. Um, but yeah, so these also don't have to be specialty machined things either. You can actually make them with readily available parts. So the one on the upper right, um, uh, yes, you can still buy them, and they will, somebody will charge you a lot of money for them. I think that's like a Thor Labs part. Um, and that's because in an optical like, laser setup where you want your parts to very precisely line up, this is, where, this is one great place to use them. Um, you can buy them, and they will be very expensive. But you can also make them for cheap uh, if you use um, kind of metal BBs and dowel pins. So those are, like, that's maybe like a dollar in parts. Um, and you can get extreme repeatability of connecting two pieces together. Um, so I, I figured I would play with this at some point. So the bottom right is me. Um, I printed a bunch of parts and then screwed in some shoulder screws and put them together. And that was kind of the first time that I, I put the coupling together and that felt really good. So I thought, okay, this might actually work if you printed this and then bought the rest of the parts. Um, so there are two couplings on Jubilee and they enable you to kind of build on top of Jubilee in two ways. The first way is with tools. So the coupling is between a tool and the carriage. So the thing on my right hand is the carriage, and the thing on the left is the tool. That's a microscope tool just for taking pictures and stitching them together. Um, and what you do is you, uh, what's happening is you have those same six points of contact, so there's the three balls, there are the three pins. And then the thing in the middle um, is not actually applying an additional, or what it's doing is it's, it is applying an additional force. So it's pulling 
the, it's pulling the, the, the tool into the carriage by means of a wedge. So there's a little wedge in the middle and that's, it's like an inclined plane. So as you twist it, you actually pull it in. And what that does is that that enables you to put a tool on, take it off, put it on again, and you don't have to realign anything. It's in the exact same spot, more or less. Um, well, for all intents and purposes, it's in the, it's in the same spot uh, as you do this over and over and over again. And in an example where you're, where you're 3D printing, you might have to do that 500 times on a single print if you're changing colors maybe every layer. So the first thing that you get is removable tools. The second thing that you get is removable bed plates. So this is actually really cool. Um, and what that means is that you can actually hot swap your beds. Um, now this is done manually, so if you wanted your machine to do 3D printing, maybe you'd load in the printing bed, um, which, which is like maybe it's magnetic, maybe it has a heater at the bottom, that's your printer bed. But maybe you want to do some liquid handling, and so you, you load in a different bed that has locations for well plates. Or maybe you want to do um, some image stitching, and so you're, you load in a, like maybe a blank plate and you put pictures of, let's say, coins, or something that you want to take high resolution pictures of and then stitch together. So the idea is that you can pop this bed out and you can actually put all your fixturing on a separate bed and then that will be the thing that goes into your tool, into your machine. So come by and play with this because it only fits in one way and it's, it's pretty strong. Um, so yes. It also to yes, yes. So if you're printing, it, it does that as well. Um, this is actually one of the cool things about the coupling, which is as you, so when you heat something up, when you heat up a metal, it will expand and it will change its shape. Um, and so if you are, if you screw down your bed um, and you heat it up, then what will happen is it will expand. And the problem is that it's expanding, but you've screwed it down so it can't, it can't move. So it warps. So it will bow up or down or it will just warp in some unpredictable way. And if you're printing and you want a really nice flat bed, it's bad because now you don't have a nice flat bed because when you heated it up, it warped. What people do now is they do this thing called software mesh bed leveling, which is they go tack a bunch of points down, they take a bunch of measurements, and then they apply a curve to the bed to compensate for it. But in my mind, it's a bit of a workaround because um, you could also just uh, heat it up in a way where it can freely expand and it doesn't warp. And that's what the coupling actually does. So when you heat this up, what actually happens is that it just grows into the coupling. Um, as it heats up, and when you cool it off, it shrinks back down, still the, inside the coupling. So it will, it will definitely expand vertically, but it won't warp, and it won't change its angle. Um, but yeah, so that's another perk of um, having it constrained with six points of contact. Oh yeah, so right now I'm using springs, um, but you don't have to. Um, you don't, I put the springs on because I travel, or, uh, to travel with them, and I'll also in case if I ever pick up the machine in lab, if I turn it over sideways, it might fall out, so I'll, I'll, I tell people to keep the springs on, but all they're doing, they're not, they're not applying an additional constraint there, but they are applying a force down, just to hold it in. Yeah, so extending Jubilee is a matter of building a new tool. So the thing that I showed you earlier was this microscope, and the way to build the microscope would be to start from the template pattern. Um, so what I did when I put together Jubilee is, at the same time E3D was releasing their motion system coupler as open source. Um, so what I figured is I'll design around their coupler system so that you can either build a tool plate off of a printed plate that you can make yourself, or you can just buy an E3D coupler plate and build your tools on top of those plates. So both of those work. Um, this is an example of an E3D plate, and then this is an example of a printed plate that you, make you can make yourself. Th they both will lock into the coupling, no problem. Um, and there are just two ways of building tools on top of Jubilee. Cool, so we have something that's fabricatable, it's extensible. Um, now we want to enable like, new things, multi-tool workflows. Um, so w what would be cool, and one thing that Jubilee can do is swap heads mid-process to do something else. Um, so that's, a, that's a, just an example of, that's, so that's automatic tool changing. Um, and what you need to do that is you need a carriage that's fairly light so that most of your weight on your carriage is devoted to carrying your tool rather than carrying yourself around. Um, you need to be able to detect that your tool is locked in correctly and then unlocked correctly, and you have to be able to kind of rely on that, that, that that's gonna 
happen thousands and thousands of times without you having to worry about it. So you can go to sleep at night and not worry. Uh, um, so um, I came up with this uh, thing that I call like the remote elastic lock. This is also on the table if people want to come by and play with it later. Um, the way this works this is actually inspired by the tentacle mechanism I built a little while ago. Um, what's happening is I would kind of describe this as a bicycle brake cable, where if you're on your bicycle and you have your brake cables, those are uh, you're, you're, when you squeeze the brakes, you're actually pulling on the cable, which then takes that f that change in length and maps it down to a change in length on your back or front wheel. And what's nice about that is that it's it's not a very complicated system. It's just one cable that you just squeeze and you you hit the brakes. Um, so the idea here is the same. It's kind of the same idea. Is that I'm going to take the motor that would actuate the the locking, so that blue pulley, which is going to twist. I'm going to take that motor off of the carriage and put it on the frame. But I'm going to reroute the force back onto the carriage. And the way to do that is just with a cable. Well, in this case, two cables. Um, and if you do that, you take all the mass of that motor, which is something that was really heavy, and now you've taken it all off of the carriage. And now so you, you preserve a light carriage that can zip around really quickly. So now, now that we're able to, to actually do the actuation, we still need to be able to detect that our tool is locked and unlocked. And so what I did is I put two limit switches inside of the remote section. So when you assemble it, you, uh, you have these two switches that go onto, into the actuator setup. One of them is on the frame, or one of them is on the, the big plate, uh, which is a M in this picture. And what that's doing, that's detecting an unlock position. There's a little tab here. That tab will touch that limit switch, this one up here, when you're unlocked, because unlocking is position-based. But locking is a little bit more complicated. Um, what I want to do is I want tools to lock only when the twist little T-bar is like fully, really stuck inside of there. So that's actually not position-based. That's torque-based. And the way I do that is with a spring. So the spring actually goes, it loops around this pulley. So what happens is you can't really see it here. That sits in the middle of here. When I actually lock the uh, lock the tool in, the T-bar the gets stuck. And what happens is that the cable goes into tension. And so as I continue to tug on it with the motor, what happens is that that starts to stretch the spring. And as you stretch the spring, eventually you stretch it far enough that you click a second switch. Um, the way that actually, that's inspired by uh, a torque wrench. So if you have a screw that you're screwing in, and at the very end you need to tighten it to a very specific amount of torque, um, you can buy a tool called a torque wrench which has a little, uh, if you buy the analog kind, it has a little dial indicator in the inside. And as you, as you turn the torque wrench, the dial indicator will turn proportional to your torque. And the way that works is with a spring. So it's essentially very much the same thing where um, I want to detect how, how much torque I'm turning something. And you can do that with the stretching of a spring and how much it deflects. I tried that, actually. That was how I started it about a year ago. And the problem is reliability. So um, there's actually there's two problems. One of them is tuning, and the second one is reliability. So I know that, so sensorless, for people who don't know quite yet, is um, it's this idea of you can get rid of your limit switch and just measure the torque, uh, measure the current of the motor. And as when your current uh, spikes goes up, that's um, because current is proportional to torque. You can tell when your when your motor or your carriage is is stuck, is stalled. So it's called stall detection. Um, the problem, though, is that it's it needs a lot of tuning. It's a bit of a finicky signal, and so it took me like two hours just to like tune the signal to get it to work really nicely. And then even after that, about one every like hundred tool changes, it would just totally not work. And so unless you're really able to condition that signal, it's it's hard. I mean, it's not a clean signal. Um, there's also just like a little bit of friction, like all that small bits of friction, all that, all that, you have to get rid of all that sensitivity. Um, it is, a, in principle, it's a great idea, um, but in practice it's hard. And even if you could tune it to get into a working spot, which I did, I can't expect like hundreds of other people who are all trying to build one to, to sit down for two hours and like twiddle, a, twiddle a sp some, some numbers until they come out just right. Um, so I went for mechanical, a uh, mechanical solution instead of an electrical one. Um, yeah, so here's a quick demo of what that ends up looking like. We're done with that layer. Get rid of that tool. Go purge that tool so it's just oozing out a little bit in the bottom. And then pick it up. Uh, do a quick wipe. And then go back to printing another color. 
and you do that hundreds of times. And so it has to be reliable for hundreds of times without, without worrying about it. Um, yeah, so we now we have, because we're able to swap tools over and over again mid-process, we can do things that we've never been able to do before. So one example is printing with soluble supports um, or just multi-material printing. But there's a, a host of other things you can do with different, with different printer, with different uh, heads and different beds. So I do have a couple examples that I'll show at the end. But um, the last thing that I wanted to do with Jubilee is I wanted it to be docu both documented and open source. So um, the build materials is online. Um, it's, it's pretty much all there. It's driven from the CAD model. So um, every once in a while, there's something that might not be in the CAD model, like these cables that I have to put in manually. But for the most part, it should be feature complete. Um, it's not super cheap, but it's not super expensive as well. Uh, so it's about 15 40 for the pr frame. And that cost is slowly going down as people in the community have actually written to me and said, hey, you can use this part because it's cheaper, um, or use this part because it will work just as well. And I've taken all that feedback and um, been able to, with a lot of help, make the build materials a little bit cheaper. Um, the, the CAD files are online. So all the SOLIDWORKS assemblies, the original ones, are there. So you can kind of pick apart the model in a bit of hierarchy. The step file is also there. So you get one giant flat file of all the parts in it, um, which can be a little bit cumbersome, but people do work with that. Um, and then finally, there are some ready-to-print files for all of the printable parts and the, and the parts that you would laser cut. Uh, it comes with assembly instructions. So this is something that was uh, very near and dear to me. I had a lot of fun with this, but it also took, it took a, quite a bit of time to get it into, into a good shape. Um, there's step-by-step -step instructions. Kind of the idea is that if you can understand how to put together a Lego set, then you can maybe understand, probably, my hope is that you can understand how to do this one. Uh, that's kind of my promise, is that I want to get it to the point where if you can build a Lego set, you can build one of these. Um, and I personally really love Lego instructions because they've done something which is they've enabled lots of people to build their Lego set without, like, almost without using words. I think they only use numbers. And that's incredible because the parts just fit together really nicely. So it would be nice to get it to that point where things fit together so nicely that I can just take out all the words. I don't think I'll ever get there, but the idea is that um, simplicity and pictures are very like, evocative of how to put something together. And the words are, it, in my mind, it kind of slows me down because I have to, and I think it slows people down because they have to say, okay, this part, this is the words, which is the name of this part, means this part in real life. I think pictures are really helpful here. So uh, I'll warn you, the pages, it's like 90 pages of instructions, but it's mostly pictures. So yeah, so it's now a documented open source. Um, yeah, so what can you actually do with it? Um, our, one of the things we do in grad school is you write papers. So we wrote a paper about it. And to write the paper, we wrote a, a, we did as many examples as we could in like two weeks. Uh, so step one was, this one took a little bit longer than two weeks. This is like the first thing I tried, was the multi-material 3D printing. I have these parts with me. If you, or you're welcome to, to, to come look at them. And again, you're just switching. You're s every time there's a color change on your layer, there's a tool change. Um, it's, I'm pretty happy with the reliability at this point. I can go to sleep and not worry about it when I wake up again. Um, but every time you have a material change, there's a, a, there's a per layer, there's a tool change. Which I, I, I probably would wake me up at night. <laughs> yeah. So, um, but yeah, uh, so the, uh, you can also, so you don't have to use just printer heads. I brought uh, a pen head that you can use to draw. Um, and so that's the one on the left. So you can have a row full of pens. And then on the right, you can have uh, multi, uh, so multi-liquid kind of liquid handling with syringes. Those are driven by peristaltic pumps. So I can pump liquid into a very specific location. I think my quintessential example, which I have yet to do, but it's totally doable, is to 3D print a water bottle like 95% of the way, fill it with water, and then 3D print the cap. Uh, but I'll do that later. Um, but in principle, it might be possible. I'm just, it, it's, it's a bit nerve wracking because liquids and high voltages are a little, they don't like each other. Uh, yeah, so um, it was released September 9. And other people are actually building it, putting it together. And this is super exciting because um, right now I, I, I want people to have this ability to do more than just print um, in their home. And I want that people to have the ability to kind of explore this programmable motion in a way that's, that lets you just bolt on new solutions and new ideas. And people are doing it. And admittedly, there are some hard to assemble sections. Um, and it is a lot, it's like a lot, it's 
several hours, so it's like a very long weekend to put it together. Um, but then you have a machine. Uh, so people have, uh, this, I think people started building things around September 9, and I think I know about 10-ish pe people at this point who have, who have told me that they're, they're building it. Um, someone actually finished like a month later, I'm actually kind of blown away. And at this point, I think they're, they're now tuning for multi-material printing, and they're, pretty, they're getting pretty close, um, which is very exciting. Um, one of the things that I is still missing from the documentation is the tuning instructions, so I'll, uh, I will get that out at some point. Um, uh, finally, there's a community of people online on Discord. There's about 400 plus people who are kind of hanging out there. They're just looking at the Jubilee project. Some of them are asking questions. Some of them are looking at the bill materials and, and providing really good feedback. Some people are doing their own thing. We made a channel for that, so if you wanted to build your own Jubilee, but not actually build the, the frame, but just use the tool changer, or just use like the, the tool pattern, or just use the bed pattern. There's, there's a whole channel for that where people are extending it in various ways and just taking kind of the design patterns out and doing their own thing with it. Um, and the idea behind this was that it was supposed to be, I mean, it still is, like a place where people can help each other with pinch points in the assembly instructions. So if you're stuck, go to the assembly help section and say, hey, you know, I'm having this problem in step three. And um, it's actually not always me who answers, which is really cool. Um, so the community is growing, or other people can actually answer questions, which is really exciting. Um, and then, but if I am there, and if it is a big issue, and there's something wrong with the instructions, I'll just go try and fix the instructions. So the instructions have been made better by people who have been very generous about um, just being very proactive about asking for help, and then making notes about, hey, you know, if, if this were, if this, if they, if they said do this first, then I wouldn't have had this problem. Um, that actually really helps make it easier for everyone else. Uh, so what's happening today? Uh, so I just, this Jubilee V2 is almost done. Uh, so after about two months of working on it, I, uh, I'm actually using this platform for something else in school where we had a really long head. Uh, it was uh, it's a long, like, sonication, stainless steel sonication tool. So it's just, it vibrates at really high frequencies and creates really high temperatures. And what we're doing is we're, we're putting that inside of a liquid to create quantum dots. I wish I could tell you more about that, but I'm just the machine designer. So I don't know about the science. Uh, so, um, basically we needed a taller machine. Um, and the other thing I saw too was that in the very beginning of the project, the first thing a lot of people were doing that they were talking about and announcing was not that they were building a, a machine, but that they were building a version, like a, a bigger version of the machine, because it, it wasn't big enough. So I thought, okay, it's not big enough, let's make it a little bit bigger. Um, so this is 300 by 300 by 190, which is a bit weird in the Z. This is 300 by 300 by 300. So um, I, I call it Cubily, like the cube version of Jubilee. Uh, and then on this end, there's a little bit less space for tools. And on this end, there's a little bit more generous section for, for deeper tools and taller tools and wider tools. Um, the other thing I did with this version is that I posted a document that says, what's your space? How much space do you have? Um, and then if it also has like a, a footprint budget. So you can build a tool up to the, a certain size. There's a document that says that you can build it up to a certain size and you won't cut away into your build plate space. And the problem right now with this version, it's not really a problem, but as your tools get deeper in this direction, your, your build plate gets smaller because you have to, you're starting to cut away sections or available space to actually move around inside of. So I made more space. Um, I also, it's actually, it's actually going to be cheaper than the original one, which is kind of bonkers, but that's actually thanks to a, lo thanks to a lot of people who have given me uh, like alternatives to some of the parts that I spec, which has been awesome. Um, you can still buy it, so that's like the single quantity price. Um, I haven't thought about kits, but maybe one day. Uh, and the extruders right now, admittedly, are kind of expensive because I maybe didn't realize it at the time, but put a lot of like premium components into one head, and it ended up being expensive. Uh, but the, so the folks at E3D are coming out with a, a cheaper extruder, which is kind of this amalgamation of many parts put together. It's called the Hemera. Um, that, I think, will be a great, cheaper, like exceptional print quality alternative, um, which hopefully becomes the standard. Um, yeah, so the price is dropping. Dropping. I haven't released these files yet, but they'll go up on the 15th. I, I bought a couple parts from DigiKey, and I'm going to install them. If they work, then I'm going to make the whole thing $10 cheaper, which is hopefully a little bit nicer for someone. Um, yeah, so getting involved, I would, so there's lots of ways to get involved. It's not, it doesn't have to be just me here. There could be other people building things and, and submitting cool stuff. Um, 
Yeah, so one way to start is to say, like, okay, what can this machine really do for me? I have this like weird motion application. I need to print pancakes of like my, I don't know, my sister. Um, and so, so one way to say, okay, like, is there a way, is there some sort of way that I can build a tool that does that for me, some sort of like pancakes, like syringing tool? Um, so that's, that's one way to start. It's gonna think about what you could do besides just printing. Um, uh, yeah, and then at that point, you can, I would say, go ahead and go build a Jubilee. Uh, join the Discord, there's a bunch of people online, that's where you can ask for help. Um, there, I, I, would, I tried to make it uh, an easier to assemble, uh, I, I tried to make it, f design it such that parts feel like they're supposed to go together. Um, you don't need to force anything, uh, for the most part. Um, so hopefully, uh, that's a, it's, a, it's a good assembly experience for people. But I'm also looking for feedback. Uh, if people want to, uh, if people have issues, that will definitely change things and make them better for the people. Yeah, build a, uh, build a new tool. Um, so our tool library right now is extruders and I think a pen head and I think I still have to post the microscope head. Um, but yeah, there's absolutely this huge space of tools that people can tap into. And I think that would be really exciting. Yes? No, I started working on it, but at, at some point. Uh, yeah, it can be done. They do, yes. They do. That's very exciting. So one of the things, that, so that was actually one of the, a great reason to actually make the, the tool plate or the, the Kara G3D compatible is now you have a library of tools that a commercial vendor like E3D will create and Jubilee is compatible with all of them. Um, and that's really cool because now we have multiple machines and a library of common tools that they can all tap into. So now printers are becoming less printing machines and more kind of multi-tool machines, which is really exciting for me. And again, yes? Sure. Yeah, yeah, and the answer is yes. So the question is like, I mean, there, well, like, kind of like a bigger general question is like, aren't, aren't there like idiosyncrasies involved with um, just picking up a tool? Are there like maybe you have to wipe the nozzle, or maybe you have to uh, like purge the the pancake ooze before you use the pancake head? And and there's different maybe pre steps for different heads. Um, so it turns out that this particular controller board lets you write little macro scripts that are invoked every tool change. Um, and so those live on the SD card. And so what you could do is put all of that kind of pre like w wiping or pre um, like extruding in that file and have it live there. Uh, what doesn't exist right now is a very seamless way to dynamically swap tools, including all of that boilerplate code. Um, but I, am work I will work on it at some point because it, it, is, it, it would be nice to have that as a convenience where you just say like, oh, I want a completely different tool and that uploads all the special parameters just for changing for that tool. But that would have to be done for every Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, so right now the, in the family of 3D printer heads, it's pretty much the same like custom script that runs. And that's also online. Right. And the boilerplate code that goes with purging them and actually picking them up. Pre-done? Oh, pretty much all of it, I would say. So these are running off the shelf boards. They're called the Duet, or they're called like Duet 2, I think is the, is the name of the board. So it's the Duet 2 with the Duet Expander. So that gives you 10, 10 motors, to, or 10 stepper motors to play with. Um, that happened to be like the, the most convenient way to do it. I was originally using a smoothie board, which is a different controller board. Um, but at that point, I was writing custom C++ firmware to actually get it to recognize, the, to, the, to do the tool change. The convenience about the Duet 2 is that it has this like scripting capability. So when I, I, when I say T0, it actually invokes a script that I wrote to actually detect the lock as it moves. And that made it a little bit easier for me to develop on this one. Um, it also makes it easier if you're building one to deploy it because you just copy all the scripts, paste them into the folder on the SD card and you're good to go. Um, but electronics, you have to do the wiring yourself. The boards are the boards you can buy. Yeah. I, I am looking into harnesses, but I'm also looking for a lot of, if anyone has uh, 
feedback on. So right now, there's no call out. It, the harness lengths aren't called out yet. And that's a to-do that we are working on right now. Um, making pre-made harnesses is, would also be a nice thing to do, but I haven't looked into people to do that for me or for everyone. To get all the parts, I would say like three weeks for the longest lead time part, which I think is an AliExpress part. Um, there, are Some of the parts, if you're familiar with them, you might say, oh, I can get that for more expensive in the US. Um, I found a vendor that's r rather cheap for some parts, but also fairly good quality. I think when I organized the bill materials, I wanted something that was the most widely available for everyone, and but also the cheapest without compromising a, a certain level of quality. So kind of this like broad accessibility of like, across, like international shipping was what I was looking for. Yeah. Um, but you can definitely find them in, for faster locally. Yes. Just counting steps. I mean, you, you can bolt that on the bottom if you buy special steppers, um, but these do not. Most printers don't. All right, that's pretty much it. Um, so CNC machines, they kind of landed in our home as 3D printers, so there's a lot more that we can do. At least I think there's a lot more we can do, so we should do it. It's like both now. <laughs> so um, it's, um, it's mostly grad school. Well, okay, a good chunk of it is, uh, it's, it's, it's very much, it's this weird thing of like, what, what is this part of? So I in grad school, we have classes in the first couple years mixed in with research. And the first year, that, that's like a 50-50 split. In the first year, I built this that as like the, the research chunk and then Pretty much all my f free random hobby time went into that also. Um, and at this point, I think my professor is kind of leaning me away from like tuning the machine and pushing me more into like use it for applications. So the research is now build a machine for this chemical engineering lab and build the UI and the software so that they can now have general purpose tool swapping so that they can do scientific in instrumentation and exploration there. So that's what I'm going to start moving into now. Um, but I am trying to get it to the point, I'm still like looking at the instructions and making it usable for other people has now become a bit of a hobby. So, but it's the, the tuning bit is, is less research and more for fun now and the, the researchy bits are now using it for weird science experiments. Yeah, uh, like yes with an asterisk. Um, it, it was easier now, but some, some places in UW are actually closing, which are going to make it a little bit harder to, to use some, some of their tools. Um, I, I am looking into a kit, and my professor, we talked about, my professor, we've talked about it. She's okay with me doing a kit, um, which is actually very, that's actually very awesome. I don't think that's something that you normally get from a lab. Um, and the fact that we're able to release it as open source with a fairly permissive license, like you can copy it and do whatever you want. You can actually, you could kitize it yourself if you wanted and sell it and make money off of it. And that is totally okay with that license. All you have to do is say that I, that my name, I designed it at some point. Um, yeah, I, I hope that answers that, your question. <laughs> uh, um, well, so uh, to make a long story short, the reason I got into machine design in the first place was because I wanted to have this like machine shop in my garage one day where I could go and make costumes and animatronics and little robot projects and RC things. And I was living in the Bay Area a few years ago, and so my, the space was very constrained. So I said, okay, what's the minimum viable project, like, pro like set of tools that I would, could get into one roof? And it was a laser cutter, a lathe, a small lathe, uh, a small mill, and a, and a capable 3D printer. And the idea was that you could put together this vocabulary of parts and processes where you m mix and match. It's kind of the idea here. You mix and match um, some precision parts with some fastener parts with some printed parts. And uh, the result is that you're able to make things pretty quickly with a reasonable level of, like, reasonable level of precision. Um, so I would like to, at some point, go back into animatronics and like, use the machine instead of develop on top of the machine. But I do love developing the machine. Yeah, that's 
a good chunk of it. I, I do also miss tinkering in electronics, but I'll go back to that at some point. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, so I think that's, that's it for me. Yeah, so feel free to come on over. I'll turn on V2 first just to demo some of the tool changing, and then I can do, uh,